Grace you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Like Renee said, uh, because this is Blessing Our Bible Sunday, we're going to take a little longer time to go through this Exodus text together, and kind of verse by verse. So I'm going to give you a couple of ways to do that. You can either follow along in chapter 3 of Exodus in your pew Bibles, which uh, you'll find starting on page 44, or uh, as Renee mentioned, there's an outline of the sermon with a place to take notes just inside that first panel of the worship bulletin and you're invited to participate. Whatever helps you stick with me as we go through here together. You know, whether you know a lot about the, the, uh, the biblical story of Moses, it's, I'm telling you already, you know his story. And it's because it's a story that writers have told and retold in various ways time and time again. When J.R.R. Tolkien wrote about Frodo, the humble hobbit in the Lord of the Rings, who was the reluctant ring bearer, he was telling the story of Moses. And when J.K. Rowling's came up with that character, Harry Potter, a teenage boy who reluctantly became aware that it was his destiny to face Lord Voldemort, she was telling Moses' story. So as you listen this morning to the more of the story, once again, don't be surprised if you find that it has parallels to your own personal story. Because really, it's just a story of God stepping into the life of a regular person and uh, a regular person with an imperfect past and calling that person to a holy task. And you're only kidding yourself if you don't think it could happen to you. So, here we go. We're going to step by step with Moses, Exodus chapter 3, beginning verse 1, where we find Moses uh, just living out a normal day. You know, punching, out the, punching the time clock at 7 a.m., so to speak. Uh, another day to find sh- uh, food and water for his sheep in the wilderness. And each one of us knows what business as usual looks like. For kids, it's another day going to school. For some of us, it's another day of sitting at a desk. It's just another day on the job like we have strung together so many. And the point I want to make is, well, this is that Moses really was just a regular guy. True, he had an unusual past, but it wasn't a past that he was proud of. It was a past that haunted him. He was a wanted man in Egypt, wanted for what we would call second-degree murder. And though he might have told himself and justified to himself that the cruel slave master had it coming, it didn't change the fact that he had to bear the consequences of taking another man's life. Okay, true, most regular people don't have murder somewhere in their past. But as a rule, regular people also have something in their past that they're not particularly proud of, something that they don't really share with anybody very openly. They just try to do better now, try to string together more good days than bad days as they go through life. Chances are you see yourself as a regular person. And that's not bad. But I feel I should tell you that God has a special fondness for regular people, as Moses was about to find out. Jump down to verses 2 and 3. It is a usual, it's a usual kind of day, but Moses that day sees something very unusual, a bush that was on fire, but it wasn't burning up. So when Moses investigates, I have to say he wasn't completely certain of what he was seeing, and he wasn't certain of what to think when he heard someone calling his name. But then down in verses 5 and 6, all that uncertainty just turned to outright fear when the voice commanded him to take off his sandals because the voice belonged to God. Now I want to linger a little bit and ask the question, why did God have Moses take off his sandals? I mean, you remember why your mom would make you take off your muddy shoes when you came into the house. And uh, we understand why some folks uh, ask everyone to take off their shoes when they come into their house. It's kind of a courtesy that says, if you help me keep my carpets clean in my house, then I'll help you keep your carpets clean when I come to your house. But there's no carpets here. 
It's just dirt. It's, it's really, it's kind of the dirt that God made. So why did God ask Moses to take off his sandals? Well, the writer tells us is because, well, the ground that he was standing on was holy ground. But I want us to think this through together. I mean, we regular people, we understand that we are not holy. And common sense tells us that you probably should keep things that are unholy away from things that are holy. So wouldn't it make more sense to keep your sandals on, you know? A little insulator uh, between the unholy and the holy. But the fact that the sandals had to come off, I think is a pretty sure sign that when it comes to God and us, God wants nothing to get in the way. It's um, that when, because the ground is holy, if God is there in that place, then the right thing to do is to fully encounter that presence. Don't throw up any roadblocks. Take off those sandals. It's true you may not feel particularly holy, but you are God's creation. God did make you. We're uncomfortable with that, though. So we put roadblocks between us and God all the time. And the two biggest roadblocks we put in the way, one is sin, when we know we're living our lives in a way that, you know, we don't want God to get very close to us and take a very close look at us. And the second roadblock we put up is shame, which is the thought that God wouldn't want anything to do with someone like me. And our shame keeps God at arm's length. A young man studying to be a pastor felt that way. Once uh, at a worship, uh, feeling like a total hypocrite, living his life in a way that did not exactly reflect the, the faith, he resolved not to take communion. He told himself that communion is for people who are actually trying to live out their faith. But when the time came for communion at that service, he found himself drawn forward instead and he imagined God saying to him, this is exactly when I want you to know that I still love you, that I forgive you, and that I still claim you as my very own. And that's because what we see as obstacles between us and God, our sin and our shame, they're not obstacles to God. So in a similar way, back in the story, God was inviting Moses, who had his own reasons for shame, he's inviting Moses into a relationship with him. When he told Moses to take off his sandals, he was inviting him into something that was very, very intimate, connecting to God, which was both scary and wonderful all at the same time. But for Moses, who was this God? who was inviting him into a relationship. What was this God like? I imagine for Moses, it was a, a picture, of, uh, the encounter was like being on a blind date when you're trying to, f in a short amount of time, figure out who is this person uh, that I'm out on this date with. So Moses was looking for any kind of clues that would tip him off about who God was, what God was like. So down in verses 7 and 8, Moses got his first glimpse of God's nature when God starts telling him, I have seen my people's misery. I have heard their cry. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them. Now, if you change that word people into the word children, and then you start thinking of all the kinds of things parents do for their children, everything from changing a wet diaper or, a, or bandaging a scraped knee to comforting them when they didn't make the team or when a friend hurt and disappointed them. If you think about the things parents do, then you get an idea of what God is like. Because God does the things moms and dads do all the time. In fact, when you think in the New Testament, when Jesus' disciples asked him to teach us to pray, he said, okay, when you pray, pray like this. And he started the prayer with the words, our Father in heaven. And the father that Jesus was describing was not an emotionally absent kind of father. 
but a father uh, who was in constant communion with Jesus. And his disciples saw that, and they were hungry to have that kind of relationship with a father like that. And can you imagine how Moses ached and longed for a father like that? I mean, he never knew his biological father. And he, though he grew up in Pharaoh's household, he grew up uh, uh, with, uh, with adopted by Pharaoh's, one of Pharaoh's many daughters, and there was no father figure in the picture. And here he was slowly beginning to realize that the God who was talking to him could best be described as a loving and caring father for his children. But whatever warm fuzzies he maybe has, was experiencing at that precise moment, they quickly evaporated when in verse 10, God says, So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. Because we know Egypt was the last place a wanted man wanted to go. And Pharaoh was the last person that Moses wanted to talk to. So Moses did what we all start doing, you know, throwing up the excuses. First one, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He was telling God, hey, you got the wrong guy. I'm just a regular guy. And though Moses couldn't see it himself, we as, as the readers now looking in onto the story, it's easy for us to connect the dots. You see... Though Moses couldn't see it, uh, when God asked him, Moses was the one who had seen the misery of the Israelite slaves in Egypt. And with his own ears, he had heard their cries, just like God had. And he knew their sufferings firsthand, the same way God did. And who better to advocate before Pharaoh than someone who had grown up in the household of Pharaoh. When you realize that this, this Moses wasn't being called to go to someplace random in the world. This was a call to go somewhere and do something in a place that he knew well. And I think that's what happens most of the time to regular people. We regular people, we aren't called to distant parts of the world as a rule, though some are thinking of one Lindsay Bamer as her mom is sitting there. But most of us are just called to simply open our eyes and our hearts to the person right in front of us, to the neighbor in need that we can see and know so well. And that certainly was in Moses' heart, who probably kept his birth family and the, the, the family of his family, who had been slaves for centuries, always on his heart and in his mind. He actually was the right person to send with God's help. You know, I, I looked for the source, but there is a story of a Christian man who was walking the, 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 the streets of the slums in Calcutta, the same streets that Mother Teresa had done her ministry in, where the poorest of the poor cling to life and do not always win that battle. And when he saw the immensity of the misery around him, he prayed, Lord, how can you let this go on? And as he continued to walk, the answer he imagined God saying to him was, how can you let this go on? See, because God is not a God who is just sits back and does nothing. God is very active, both in our lives and in our world. I mean, after all, we, in this story, we find out that God's name itself is a verb. God is always doing. But because God has invited us into this special relationship with him, he also then invites us to join in the work that he is doing out there among us. Chances are we're very much like Moses, very much aware of another person's need, another person's misery, but we respond like Moses saying, who am I to do anything about that? I'm just one person. And God's response to Moses is God's response to us. 
I will be with you. Which is also a reminder that whatever God calls us to, it's still God's work. It's not our work. It's God's work. And he's, he's not only going to be with us in that work, but he's already very actively working behind the scenes in that situation. You know, Moses didn't realize it at the time. In fact, he was going to, if you keep reading through chapter 4, he thinks up of every possible excuse he can to tell God why he shouldn't go. But in fact, what was happening in this moment, this day in his life was going to be a, a, a fork in the road that was going to now fill his life with incredible blessing. And yes, it was not going to be easy. But years later, when he could look back, he would be glad that God had invited him that day to be part of the work that God was doing. And to bring it on home, almost 10 years ago, uh, two of our members, Daryl Johnson and Art Winky, responded to the hunger they knew existed in this world and together uh, made Kids Against Hunger a reality in Sioux Falls. About seven years ago, a couple of our members, Jackie Bailey and Aaron Westcott, had discerned that, you know, people in our community needed more than food. They needed toilet paper and diapers and laundry detergent, and Necessities for Neighbors was born. About two years ago, uh, another two of our members, Carolyn Dotson and Rebel Hurd, wanted to do something to minister to the homeless in Sioux Falls. Rebel is now the lay mission developer for the church on the street. I tell you, we know these people, and they are just regular people. But I will tell you also that every one of them will tell you how much their life has been blessed because they stepped out to follow where God was calling. Likewise with us. We might be reluctant. We might say, who am I to tackle this? The problem is way too big. But there is good news in that such app opportunities are actually ways through which God brings blessing into our life. First of all, God gives us blessing by, by just giving us an opportunity to find meaning and value that comes in doing something for others, something that makes life worth the journey. But we're also blessed because in the doing, we are deepening our relationship with God, learning to, that we can trust God to be there on those difficult days, and certainly on the days that bring us joy. Like I told you, God has a fondness for regular people. And though God won't ever stop loving us if we are slow or reluctant to say yes, I can tell you and warn you right from the start that God is very persistent and very persuasive. And maybe that's because God knows what ultimately brings each one of us joy. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all our understanding keep our hearts and minds focused on Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.